Okay, here we're looking at the equation for photosynthesis, which you hopefully are becoming more familiar with. In this video lecture, we're going to go over some of the roles of these components and why they're needed to be able to carry out this necessary process for life. So looking specifically at the first one, carbon dioxide is important. Now, carbon dioxide enters through the stomata of the leaf, and it's got to make a little bit of a journey to get to where it's needed to be used. First, it's going through the stroma, then it's diffusing through the cell wall, and then the membrane, and then to the cytoplasm before finally reaching the chloroplast. So there is a little bit of a process that is required. Now, carbon dioxide is the source of carbon. So all of the lignin and carbon sources for the sugars, uh, polysaccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides, all comes from the carbon of carbon dioxide. Now, as we increase a concentration of carbon dioxide that a plant may be experiencing, we notice the rate of photosynthesis will also increase. However, there's a certain point, point of saturation here, where it begins to plateau. Here we're adding more carbon dioxide, but our photosynthetic rate is not increasing. It levels off. And this could be due to certain limiting factors. It could be water to the plant, it could be nutrients. Um, there's certain limiting factors that occur. You see in this graph here, uh, we'll ties it with a little bit of numbers, our ambient um, carbon dioxide level is about 410 or so, so we're kind of in this range. You can see there is some benefit to adding increased levels of carbon dioxide. But then there's a certain point where our rate just maxes out and plateaus there. So just know that carbon dioxide is important. It's got to be diffused to get to the chloroplast and is the source of carbon for this process to occur. Another very important component is water. It's used for many purposes in a plant. Less than 1% goes to the photosynthetic process. Most goes for cooling. I mentioned that plants are receiving the light, they're generating a lot of heat with that. Through their transpiration process, they're able to cool themselves. Water is also the source of electrons, which as you remember are on the outer um, shell here. These are valence electrons of our atom. Remember in their nucleus is our protons and neutrons. Oxygen is a byproduct because we're going to be splitting water. And limiting water can directly limit this photosynthetic process. Reason being, when a plant is turgid or has enough water, the guard cells open the stomata. This is great because it allows carbon dioxide in, allows oxygen to leave, but in addition to oxygen leaving, water will also be leaving. When a plant becomes water stressed, those guard cells become shrunken and close off. It's eliminating water from leaving, but it's also preventing oxygen from leaving and carbon dioxide from entering. So this water can directly impact the stomata, which can impact the rate that photosynthesis can occur. Light is another necessary component, and light has many different wavelengths. Not all colors use, are used in the same proportion. Longer wavelengths are our reds and oranges, and our shorter wavelengths are our violets, our indigos, and our blues. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. We have our increasing here in energy with our shorter wavelengths. So X-rays and UV rays have more energy than do our infrared rays. Now we're going to see that the chlorophyll uses different parts of this particular spectrum. So what does that actually look like? This is one of the graphs and charts that would look like here. So our chlorophyll, again, this is the site where all this is occurring. It's a very important component. It has properties similar to hemoglobin in our, in our own uh, bodies. Chloroplast structures are where this is actually occurring. And there's different types of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll A is the dominant chlorophyll. We see here that represented by the absorbance in the solid line. And we'll notice it's this blue um, to kind of dark, dark green color. And then it drops off when we get to greens and yellows. We notice another spike for chlorophyll A in the red spectrum. So these are the absorption lights. Now we talk about different wavelengths that are measured in nanometers. And this is showing the specific colors that chlorophyll A is, is able to absorb. Chlorophyll B allows the photosynthetic process to occur over a broader spectrum of light as energy is transferred to chlorophyll A. Now chlorophyll B is these long dashed lines. And we'll notice the peaks for chlorophyll B are close to, but different than chlorophyll A. What this is allowing the plant to do is absorb different wavelengths of light. And beta carotene also is slightly different. Now plants are mostly green color, 
because they're reflecting a lot of that green. Plants don't absorb a lot of that green color. We see strong in the reds and the blues are the wavelengths or the light energy that plants are typically absorbing at a greater um, percentage. Now the world's components, the electron transport chain. So our electron transport chain, it's non-cyclic, meaning it only goes in one direction. Try to put a picture here of one direction to help you realize that this particular electron transport chain is only progressing in one direction. Where is it occurring? Well, we're back to our chloroplast. It's important to keep yourself oriented. Remember, the stroma is the aqueous fluid surrounding the granum. So we see it here. And the thylakoid lumen is occurring inside, in this case it's represented by the red here, um, inside the actual thylakoid, inside those actual discs. Now we're looking at a phospholipid bilayer. We're going to be investigating the proteins embedded in that. Just because here our thylakoid lumen is on the lower side and our stroma is on the upper side, don't think that's always the case. Keep in mind that these proteins could be down here and it could flip. So just be able to orient yourself depending on what picture that I give you to keep in mind that the thylakoid lumen is inside those discs and the stroma is on the outside. And this electron transport chain that we see is producing an end product. We'll see in the Kelvin cycle, for example, things need to be regenerated. That's not the case here. It's a transport chain. It occurs only in one direction. This might be a little confusing right now, and that's okay, but I'm stressing the point that's non-cyclic electron transport. We're seeing our light energy exciting our electron. We see all these arrows going one way. We're re-exciting that electron and moving over here, producing an end product. This is non-cyclic. It's called the Z scheme because it kind of looks like a Z. While this may seem a little confusing right now initially, if you come back to this video after watching some of my others, hopefully you'll be able to understand what the photosystems are doing, what some of the necessary um, proteins are also contributing to be able to allow this necessary process for life to occur.